Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Laird, and I'd like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for inviting me to share my research with you today. Um, it's a great honor and thrill to be able to give one of the keynote presentations. Um, I really wish that I was there in person to share with you um, in, a, in a real live audience. Um, but uh, in these difficult times, it looks like we're going to be broadcasting from my basement here. So um, today, I'd like to talk about the origins of DNA methylation abnormalities in cancer. And I'd like to start by going back to a slide that people in the cancer epigenetics field have been showing for probably about three decades or so. And that is the changes that happen to DNA methylation patterns um, during malignant transformation. And we get that information by, by comparing DNA methylation profiles in normal cells, normal tissues to those in, in tumor cells or cancer uh, tissues. And um, what we've observed um, for many decades now is two very different types of changes. Um, of course, there's some other ones more recently. I'm not going to talk about enhancer demethylation and things like that, or, or CTCF binding site alterations. But if we focus for a minute here on these two that have been known for many decades, there's a widespread loss of methylation at low density CPGs throughout the genome, um, initially thought um, mostly represented by repetitive elements, um, but they're really um, restricted to uh, certain regions of the genome that I'll go into in a minute. And then on the other hand, uh, CPG islands, uh, more dense regions of normally unmethylated CPGs can acquire abnormal DNA methylation, which can lead to silencing, transcriptional silencing of the gene associated with that CPG island at its promoter. So what I'd like to share with you today is some thoughts about what the underlying basis is for these changes, um, as, and a little bit less about what the functional or phenotypic consequences are for the changes. So I'm going to start with the hypomethylation, the loss of methylation. And I'm going to go back to a paper we published two years ago, uh, where we looked at 48 TCGA whole genome by sulfide sequence uh, data sets. Um, and you can see there at the top that they include matched adjacent uh, tissues. And uh, 342 additional non-TCGA whole genome by sulfide sequence samples, which we use for comparison. And uh, this was a collaboration with Ben Berman and Hui Shen. Um, and one of the, the major uh, players in this was uh, Wan Ding Zhou, who was a postdoc shared by Hui Shen and myself at uh, the Nandal uh, Research Institute, and who is now uh, a PI at Chopper uh, and UPenn. So one of the striking things we found uh, when we looked at, at these uh, very large data sets uh, at a base pair resolution is that um, when you plotted DNA methylation um, by uh, bin sizes that varied uh, from 10, 10 megabases down to 10 KB or, or lower, you saw that in the newborn uh, T cell as one example here, there was fairly uniformly high levels of DNA methylation indicated by the yellow color. And the vertical scale shows the different bin sizes or scales. Uh, when we looked at a very old individual, 103 year old uh, T cell, so the same cell type, you saw that there were certain regions uh, that uh, were really um, megabase in size and were still visible even up to this uh, over one megabase in, um, in bin size, you could see loss of uh, DNA methylation indicated by the increased um, blue color uh, here. And then uh, in a, a leukemia from a, from a younger adult of the same cell type or the same cell of origin sh showed even deeper loss of methylation. And this was re reminiscent of the partially meth methylated domains that uh, Lister and Ecker and being rented and shown back in 2009 as contrasted to the highly methylated domains, which you see here on the right. And we found that these um, domains were associated with lamina attachments to the nuclear, um, uh, so the attachment to the nuclear lamina, as well as 
late uh, replication, so late um, uh, DNA synthesis late in the, in the S phase. And um, it maps fairly nicely, as you can see here, if you compare where the loss of methylation is, where the lamina attachment regions are, and where the late replication uh, regions are. So um, since we saw this progressive loss, uh, we, we thought, well, could be either just a time dependent consequence with an active process, or alternatively, it could be associated with cell division and incomplete maintenance methylation uh, after each DNA uh, synthesis. So here I'm showing a depiction of a CPG dinucleotide, which is the target for most of the DNA methylation in the genome, this methyl CPG in a double-stranded situation. And after DNA replication, the newly synthesized strand uh, is unmethylated at the cytosine and needs to be remethylated by DNMT1 primarily uh, to yield the fully methylated CPG dinucleotide again. If you fail in that remethylation, then you retain this hemimethylated state. And if you then undergo another round of DNA replication, you end up with the daughter strand here being the template for synthesis and giving rise to a fully unmethylated state, which can only be remethylated uh, by de novo methylation. So um, this is a passive process and it's essentially a block of remethylation uh, during um, uh, the, the normal S phase remethylation step um, during cell division and mitosis. So our hypothesis was that loss of PMB methylation is a consequence of incomplete maintenance methylation during cell division. And um, if that is the case, then highly proliferative tumors, tumors that have undergone very large numbers of cell division should have deeper PMBs than slower growing tumors, which presumably have had fewer um, cell divisions in their past. And so we decided to estimate the proliferative rate of each tumor in the TCJ dataset by gene expression profiles, and then rank these tumors by PMD depth and evaluate the gene expression profiles. And we found something quite striking. So what you see here from left to right is an analysis of 3,414 primary tumors from TCGA, ranked by, on the left, relatively little loss of methylation at PMDs, all the way to very deep hypomethylation, a lot of loss on the right. And if you look at, uh, at the top panel here, this shows cell cycle expressed genes. You can see that uh, there's more red for high expression levels of the cell cycle expressed genes on the right than there is on the left. So the proliferative tumors are on the right and the less proliferative tumors are on the left. And you might think, well, that may just be a consequence of higher uh, DNMT expression in the um, shallow hypomethylation ones that are able to retain their methylation more, or perhaps um, uh, the, the TET uh, activity is lower. Uh, but we found actually the exact opposite. Since uh, DNMTs are in part uh, cell cycle controlled, we saw, found that highly proliferative tumors actually had relatively high DNMT expression despite the loss of more methylation in, on the, in the tumors uh, that are proliferative. And um, conversely, uh, tumors that had um, relatively little loss had relatively low DNMT1 expression. And on the other hand, uh, the TET expression was not particularly high in those tumors that had deep hypomethylation. So this does not appear to be a consequence of relatively high TET expression causing uh, loss of methylation at these sites. So this very much confirms that this is linked to cell cycle, but it's correlative data. And so we wanted to test this hypothesis. And uh, so the hypothesis that we framed is that loss of PMD methylation is a consequence of incomplete maintenance methylation during cell division. And the question is whether we can show that cell division leads to loss of PMD methylation. And uh, we decided to test that in primary human cell culture. And this work is led by a very talented graduate student, Jamie Endicott, you see here on the right. And uh, what she did was uh, take various cell types and culture them 
these are primary cell uh, cells from, from human biopsies uh, that have been established uh, by Coriel. And uh, we're cultured then um, for uh, dozens of population doublings shown here on the horizontal axis. And she looked at the median methylation change of different CPG contexts, both in PMDs shown here on the left and at HMDs shown here on the right. And as you can see in PMDs, all of these CPG contexts actually lose DNA methylation fairly progressively during uh, cell culture, cell division. At the HMDs, there's actually a split between, um, in, dependent upon the uh, sequence context of the CPGs. So social CPGs are ones that have um, two or more CPGs within 35 base pair flanks uh, of the CPG dinucleotide, whereas solo CPGs are those that do not have any other CPGs within the flanks here. And you can see that, um, that uh, both in the uh, PMDs and in the HMDs, the solo and then WCGW, which is a CG flanked by either an A or a T, are the ones that lose methylation the most. In the HMDs, the, um, the social WCGWs uh, through SCGSs can hang on to their methylation better and maybe even slightly gain some. And this may be related to accumulating CPG island hypermethylation or polycomb target methylation um, in these uh, highly methylated domains. This is just to show you what the data actually looks like. Here are three replicate um, samples uh, grown for about 40 population doublings. It's a neonatal fibroblast culture. And you can see beautifully how across the board um, for these solo WCGWs here that are located within PMDs, you see this very nice progressive loss. Uh, the rows indicate um, the, the uh, different CPGs. The, the columns are uh, different DNA samples taken at different time points in the three replicates. And um, you can see that uh, methylation indicated by red here is very high and blue is very low. And you can see this shift from green to blue and from red to orange. Uh, so across this spectrum of different methylation starting points, you see progressive loss of methylation in these cells. When uh, Jamie looked at different cell types, she found that this was not restricted to fibroblasts and every single cell type she's looked at so far, which includes keratinocytes, uh, as I mentioned, fibroblasts, smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells, all show the same uh, progressive loss. The slopes are similar, but not identical. And the starting points are different, uh, perhaps reflecting uh, the, the different numbers of uh, past mitosis since very early development. So listening to this, you may ask yourself, well, how do you know that this is actually cell division? Because as these cells are being cultured, they're also undergoing a passage of time. Although it's relatively brief, a uh, question of months as opposed to years in the in, the, in vivo situation, you could argue that we have not disentangled uh, time versus mitosis. So how can we um, separate the effects of mitosis versus time passage? Well, one way that Jamie tried is to use cell cycle risk by mitomycin C. And then the other way is to use uh, growth reduction by serum deprivation in fibroblasts. And here you see that treatment in, with mitomycin C shown in blue um, for three different cell types essentially blocks the loss of methylation. Uh, what we're showing here is the median PMD solo WCG methylation. And in red is uh, a control uh, that was not blocked in its cell cycle. And you can see that, uh, I'm not showing it here, but um, the cell divisions have been blocked for the blue uh, treatment group and not for the control. And you see that the methylation loss um, is blocked as well. So it, it correlates very nicely uh, with the block of cell division and not with the passage of time. And, and on the horizontal axis here is phase and culture. Then uh, here's uh, fibroblasts um, uh, deprived of serum, or at least um, down to uh, a level of 0.5%. And you can see here the control at 15% at the bottom continues to show this progressive loss of methylation. And as you reduce serum 
concentrations in this culture, your, your growth retards, slows down, the number of cell divisions slows down, and you see this block of, uh, uh, of, of further pro progressive loss of methylation. Again, so, and it's in a it's sort of a nice uh, dose uh, response uh, um, uh, way. So this really suggests to us very strongly that it's cell division that is driving this process of loss of methylation. So what is the mechanism behind this? Um, we propose that it's incomplete maintenance uh, as opposed to say uh, hyperactive TET uh, um, enzymes. And um, the, some of the features, um, we have some hypotheses for um, as potential explanations. So the difference between WCGW and SCGS, which is the CG rich um, CPG sequence context, um, DNMT1 enzyme has a preference for GC rich planking sequences. So that may be a, a sort of a biochemical consequence. Um, difference between solo and dense CPGs may be related to the processivity of the DNMT1 enzyme. And the difference between PMD and HMD uh, regions of the genome uh, may be twofold. One is the late replicating uh, part is that there's, when you replicate late in S phase, there's just less time for remethylation after you finish DNA synthesis. So um, you've missed the bus if you don't uh, um, remethylate uh, relatively quickly at the end of S phase. The lamina attachments may be responsible for differential recruitment of DNMT3 and or, and or B. So uh, H3K36 trimethylation uh, recruit, recruitment of DNMT3B and gene bodies versus uh, say H3K36 dimethylation recruitment of DNMT3A in intergenic regions um, may um, be part of the explanation for uh, a difference in um, the efficiency of maintenance uh, methylation and, and we we found some uh, correlative data to suggest that that might e might indeed be the case for H3K36 prime methylation. So now I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to move over to the other half of the story uh, that I started out with, and that is what are the mechanisms of CPG island hypermethylation? And there's way more known now about this um, than I have time to go over. Today, um, I, I, I will touch on the cell of origin a little bit and, and particularly the pre-existing epigenetic state, um, mutations in epigenetic regulators. Uh, we were just talking about H3K36 uh, trimethylation. So uh, CEP2, for example, causes uh, uh, mutations in, in human cancers, causing increased DNA methylation in gene bodies. Um, Environmental and pathogenic influences, reactive oxygen species, inflammation. Uh, I'll show you an example of an Epstein Barr virus um, in the, the gut microbiome. Uh, we know of quite a few influences that um, can uh, cause uh, changes to the or, or increased hypermethylation at CPG islands. And of course, if you silence an important uh, gene relevant to cancer, um, such as a driver like uh, BRCA1, or uh, a mismatch repair gene like MLH1, uh, that can provide a clonal selective advantage. So Toshi Hinoue, who's uh, a longtime member of my laboratory, um, did an analysis for a paper we published with uh, much of the TCJ community last year, or sorry, two years ago, um, references shown on the bottom right, where we looked at more than 10,000 human tumors, uh, and Toshi looked at the CPG island hypermethylation patterns within these 10,000 tumors. And uh, he began with first identifying CPGs that were unmethylated in normal tissues so that he could look specifically at gain of methylation in cancers. And uh, when he looked at uh, these 10,000 tumors, he's, and he did an unsupervised clustering without knowing what the tumors were, uh, he found um, very distinct patterns. And when we then went to unveil what types of cancers these were, it turned out that they clustered very much according to uh, cancer subtype. And the interesting thing about that is you can see here on the left, this is a, a thousand different normal tissues from all parts of the body. We don't have pre-existing DNA methylation at, at appreciable levels here. Uh, but yet there's a very tissue specific or cancer type specific uh, methylation pattern uh, evident in the different types of cancer. And we believe that that's in part due to the chromatin 
uh, epigenetic state of the cell of origin. Some of these um, we identified as having unique origins, like uh, this, uh, what we call G-SIMP, uh, which uh, we, we described in uh, 2010 uh, in a paper where we found that this was associated with IDH1 mutations, and we later learned that this was uh, attributable to accumulation of 2-hydroxybutyrates um, in these tumors, which uh, blocks uh, demethylating dioxygenases. So we understand something about uh, the origins there. The precise patterns of where these um, arise likely has to do with uh, where TETs are normally keeping these CPG islands uh, unmethylated. In the gastrointestinal tract, we found example both in the upper and lower GI for a uh, separate um, CPG island methylator phenotype, which was first described by Minoru Toyota and Jean-Pierre Issa back in uh, 1999. And we had shown that in colorectal cancer, it's associated with BRAF mutation, but not in gastric cancer. And then we also identified this, what we called gastric EVV sin. And I wanted to go into um, the GI tract in a little bit more detail. I just want a separate paper um, published at the same time in Cancer Cell. Um, Toshi actually uh, um, focused on the hypermethylation patterns of the upper and lower GI tract and split them out here. This is an unsupervised uh, clustering of uh, more than 900 uh, different um, uh, uh, gastrointestinal adenocarcinomas. And you can see very distinct methylation patterns. Uh, here on, in the center, you see this red group, um, which is gastric cancers that have evidence of EBV uh, infection, very heavy CPG island hypermethylation. But note also this simp high group here with extensive CPG island hypermethylation and for colorectal here, simp low group. And overall, you can see quite extensive hypermethylation throughout most of these tumors that is mostly lacking in the normal tissues, although we sometimes see stomach epithelium with some of this pre-existing um, hypermethylation as well. So Toshi has um, more recently looked uh, at uh, the chromatin uh, states using chrome HMM of the CPGs that undergo methylation. And uh, shown here uh, on the left is the chrome HMM states. Uh, they're collapsed to just uh, three states here, plus a, a gray one, which is another group. Um, for probes, CPGs that um, were unmethylated both in normal tissues and in um, the vast majority of cancers. And you can see broken down here in green active states, in yellow uh, states that have both polycomb repression and active uh, states, so, so bivalent states, and then in red polycomb repressed. And you can see that as you add groups with more cancer specific methylation, you see this big jump in the representation of polycomb repression, but this is chrome HMM from human embryonic stem cells. And here you see chrome HMM from human fetal large intestine. And you see more or less the same story, although you see more uh, um, full-blown polycomb repression in the large intestine chrome HMM. And uh, this is uh, likely due to some uh, loss of active marks at some of the uh, um, polycomb targets that are involved are not involved with lineage specification in the intestine. So this suggests a very prominent role for stem cell polycomb repression in identifying CPGs that uh, acquire methylation specifically in cancers. So the model that we came up with quite a few years ago is that in a normal adult stem cell, you have this polycomb repression, which is transient, which helps to repress master transcription factors that normally regulate the um, differentiation of different cell lineages. And under normal differentiation, you get loss of this polycomb repression and you get the master transcription factor turned on and uh, you get activation of tissue specific genes giving rise to the differentiating cell. What we propose is that occasionally there's a crosstalk, an epigenetic switch from polycomb to a more permanently repressed uh, state by DNA methylation. 
Uh, Tim Bester had suggested a role for KDM2B. We have not been able to uh, reproduce that result, um, but I, I mentioned it here. Um, and um, so what happens is the polycomb gets removed and replaced by this permanent silencing with uh, frank DNA methylation at the promoter of these transcription factors. What that means is that this transcription factor is now very difficult to turn on. And so you can't activate the lineage specific differentiation pathway. So you have something of a differentiation block. And that kind of rogue stem cell could be a um, sitting duck to turn into a cancer cell and acquire uh, mutations in gatekeeper uh, driver uh, mutations, et cetera. So if this is true, this, this hypothesis, then that suggests that cancer may initiate with an epigenetic differentiation defect by silencing polycomb target master regulators. And back in 2007, we and, um, and two other groups, uh, uh, including here, um, uh, Steve Balin's group uh, and uh, Howard Cedar's group um, published that uh, polycomb targets are uh, more likely to undergo this cancer-associated DNA methylation. So um, there are several lines of evidence for polycomb target gene hypermethylation that pre-exists before the malignant transformation starts. And I don't have time to go over the evidence, um, but I'll just mention them here. Polycomb target DNA methylation is detectable in normal tissues at very low levels. It actually also increases with age, as does the risk for malignant transformation. Polycomb target DNA methylation is in human tumors is actually mostly clonal, even though it's at hundreds of sites. So that suggests that it's there at the um, start of clonal expansion. DNMT1 hypomorphic mice suppress tumor formation. And loss of APC does not initiate tumors in all types of cells or all cells. So a subset of cells is susceptible to this gatekeeper uh, mutation. So the hypothesis that we have is that epigenetic switch from polycomb repression to permanent silencing at important master regulators of intestinal differentiation blocks differentiation and predisposes to malignant transformation. So, Let's investigate the malignant potential of this pre-existing DNA methylation prior to tumor initiation. This is not easy to do, uh, but one of the models that we've developed, we haven't published this yet, yet, but I'll share it with you, is to create a mouse model in which we've tagged a transcriptional repressor, a LAC repressor, to the wild type APC locus downstream of it with an autocleavage site. And um, this repressor is expressed uh, then together with the wild type APC. The other allele in this mouse has a mutation in the APC gene. Uh, so it's an APC min mouse. And uh, the, the repressor uh, acts on, the transcriptional repressor acts on the promoter of an engineered promoter of, a DNA, of the endogenous DNMT1 gene, reducing suppressing expression of DNMT1 uh, in all cells uh, that are expressing DNA, uh, APC wild type allele. In order for tumors to develop in this APC min mouse, you need to undergo loss of heterozygosity of uh, this uh, uh, APC locus such that only the APC min locus remains. And so you get LOH of APC and that initiates a tumor. And since the repressor is now gone, you actually have normal levels of DNMT1. So what this accomplishes is that in the cells of the normal intestine, DNMT1 is strongly suppressed. It's not fully blocked, but it's suppressed. But as soon as you start tumor formation, you actually regain normal DNMT1 expression. So that allows us to ask the question whether the pre-existing epigenetic state as influenced by DNMT1 is relevant to the number of tumors that we see. And this, uh, uh, immunohistochemistry for DNMT1 shows that, uh, that indeed DNMT1 is suppressed in the normal intestinal epithelium. This is called a Swiss roll. And when you go loss, undergo loss of heterozygous and you initiate tumor genesis or dysplasia shown here by h &E, and then you get re re restoration of DNMT1 expression. So when we compared the number of tumors arising in the scenario of uh, a APC min mouse 
with um, this modified DMMT1 locus, but without the, uh, the LAC repressor attached to the wild type APC locus, we see uh, about 50, median of about 50, or uh, average of about 50 tumors. But when we um, look at the uh, number of tumors in this uh, mouse with the repressor, we see uh, about a, a half-fold reduction in the average number of tumors, suggesting that pre-existing DNA methylation changes play a role in tumor predisposition. And if you make it difficult for, say, hypermethylation to arise, you suppress the number of tumors that can arise or the dysplasia, um, even when you get loss of APC. I'm going to now switch gears to something different. Um, we've been working for several years with uh, Illumina and uh, Life Epigenetics, now called Foxo Bioscience, to develop a mouse infinium DNA methylation array. We found these infinium arrays to be extremely helpful in the TCJ project, and uh, we wanted something equivalent in the mouse. And we're pleased to uh, announce that Illumina will, and uh, Foxo Bioscience uh, both will be making this array uh, commercially available uh, within a few months. And um, uh, our, our group was responsible for the, the content design, uh, primarily one being Joe again. Um, so if you have complaints about the content, uh, please direct them to us. Um, uh, this is just a brief summary of some of the types of features, uh, tish, uh, uh, transcription start sites, uh, enhancers, gene bodies, CPG islands, non-coding RNA, CTCF binding sites, et cetera, imprinting loci, you name it. Um, we tried to make sure that everything was included. We even included strain-specific SNP probes, several hundred, so that you can actually map different parts of the genome or check for the strain, mouse strain, uh, that you have. This uh, array performs beautifully. Um, just quickly in some beta tests, we, um, I'm showing here four technical replicates run at our institute, um, and you can see the correlation coefficients among these uh, replicates was about 0.997. This is just to give you a feel for the kind of data. This is tissue specific methylation, 42 different tissues uh, shown here on the right uh, of different ages. And uh, here are the individuals uh, involved in helping uh, to um, make this, uh, this, this happen, this, uh, this, this um, array data testing. Uh, Toshi then did a similar type of analysis I showed for human uh, using the array, and we looked at 27 tumors from different tumor models, APC min, SMAD3, uh, knockout, uh, MLH1, uh, several different ones, and identified again that the cancer-specific methylation is overrepresented um, by polycomb occupancy. So here's the model that we have. Um, and uh, so we have a, a stem cell in the crypt uh, that normally gives rise to um, daughter cells, uh, as you see here. And if you were to have stem cell with polycomb target methylation, um, we're proposing that if you lack that, if you have normal levels of polycomb target methylation or not, not very much at all, or not the right sites, um, you don't progress if you lose, say, uh, APC or, or some other driver event. Uh, but if you do have polycomb target methylation and you get a gatekeeper mutation, you, are, you can progress because the polycomb target methylation has suppressed uh, the growth um, or differentiation specific uh, transcription factors and, and you have this blocked differentiation facilitating this progression. So the hypothesis is a subset of stem cells of acquired aberrant polycomb target hypermethylation blocking differentiation and predisposing to malignancy. Can we identify such rogue stem cells? And I already mentioned that if you do um, deep sequencing of normal epithelium, you can detect low levels of methylation of these uh, polycomb targets, but we don't know whether they're stochastically distributed among uh, different cells or whether they are um, grouped together in or clustered in such rogue stem cells. And the only way to really reveal that is to do single cell sequencing. So um, uh, we developed a high coverage um, improved protocol uh, sequencing uh, that allows us to assess uh, more accurately how what fraction of polycomb targets are methylated uh, in each cell. And we use LGR5 
um, as, uh, expressing cells to identify stem cells from the mouse colon or small intestine. And um, uh, this shows the results from 449 such stem cells, each one individually characterized. And on the vertical axis, you see the PMD methylation state. So the lower the methylation, the more cell divisions the cell has gone through. On the horizontal axis is the percent of, of polycomb target CPG islands that are methylated. So on the right are the ones that have more methylation. And triangles are colon tissues or cells. Um, the circles are small intestine. And here you see on the right, the legend for age. And you can see very nicely how young mice, individual cells start out with relatively methylated PMD solo WCGWs and then slowly um, lose that as they get older, but particularly also they gain uh, methylation at polycomb targets, but at variably, variable rates. It does increase as a function of age, uh, but it's, it certainly um, has a wide dispersion. And we noted this one stem cell over here with more than 40% of the polycomb target CPGs islands that are, are methylated. And this was a 26 month old a colon intestinal stem cell, at least LGR5 positive. So um, we think I've shared the hypothesis uh, throughout. Um, we don't have firm evidence yet um, completely, but I, uh, I did want to sort of share these uh, sort of hypothetical results with you so far, both on loss of methylation and at poly, at uh, PMDs, at solo WCGWs, as well as gain uh, of methylation at polycomb targets. And um, obviously the work that I showed was, was done by a very large army of people. I, uh, I hesitate to point out individual people here because um, er, there's so many people that um, participated so actively. Obviously uh, you saw uh, Toshi's name pop up quite a lot uh, throughout the talk. Um, while he set up the, the single cell um, uh, protocol uh, Hui Shen is my collaborator, who's uh, a bioinformatics expert, and um, and several people from her group, not shown in this photo, uh, were very instrumental in getting the single cell uh, data analysis to work. Uh, Wan Ding was obviously um, um, a fantastic asset for both the PMD and single cell work, and uh, Jamie, I mentioned the um, the uh, the uh, cell culture to show uh, that PMD hypomethylation tracks with cell division. Thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions.